things are gonna get crazy! <laughs> Most everyone's mad <laughs>to another exciting episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast. How are you all doing, everyone? I hope you all had a nice weekend. And also, I would like to say Happy Thanksgiving. And I know that may sound a little bit random, but keep in mind that I am Canadian. And this weekend in Canada, we had Thanksgiving. So yes, uh, during that time, I did spend a moment with my family where we all got together and we all had some turkey to go and eat along with many of the other stuff. And uh, by the way, on a side note, thank you very much, Daniel, to be the new fish or to be the first new fish of this episode. Uh, but anyways, back to what I was talking about. Yes, it was Thanksgiving. We all had a very thankful time and a very nice time to just get together and catch up on some stuff. And uh, with that said, I would like to go and share the thankfulness to you all and that hopefully you all had a nice weekend, regardless if you were alone, just relaxing, or if you also had uh, spent some time with some family and friends. But with that said, though, um, I will go and try to continue this uh, Thanksgiving celebrations or the Canadian Thanksgiving celebrations on to here, where we got a whole bunch of trailers and a whole lot of animation news stories to go and discuss. And trust me, this will all result in one heck of a fun time like we usually have over here in this podcast. So with that said and done, now I would like to go on to the chat wall and I'd like to ask you all, are you ready for today's episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast? Let me hear it folks now, are you ready? Let's see here, are people actually ready? Oh wow, yes, yes, I do see people are definitely prepared. People are ready. Uh, <laughs> by the way, someone asked if uh, Canadian Thanksgiving meals are different than the American ones. And uh, the answer for that is actually no. We pretty much have the same thing. The turkey, the stuffing, the peas, the gravy, all the works, yes, they are all featured. The only difference is just that we do it on the second week of October instead of being like in the second half of November where it's just way too close to Christmas. But anyways, I do say, I, I do see that everybody is all prepared. That is wonderful. And with all, said, with all that said and done, let's not waste any more time. It is now actually time to go and get things started. And with our first story that I have for you today, we're going to do something a little bit different than what we regularly do here. Now, I have two trailers that I would like to show you. Oh, just two trailers for this episode? Oh, no, 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 no. Much more than that, in fact. Well, <laughs> it's actually that I have two trailers for this segment. Yes, we are going to be checking out two trailers in a row, uh, both of which I find that they seem to be very similar in more ways than just the trailer itself and the time of it, considering that both of them are like around 75 seconds each, maybe a minute or whatever. But I decided we're going to go and check out these two trailers right over here. So let's not waste any more time with the first trailer that I would like to go and present to you is going to be from Netflix as we are now going to go and take a look at the upcoming animated series Gentry Chow versus the Underworld. Does this outfit say I'm fun, approachable, and definitely won't set fire to you? Keep me alive. Uh... And that is Gentry Chow versus The Underworld, to which the series is going to be coming out on Netflix on December 5th. But hold on, there is another that we need to go and check out. Yes, the next one is actually going to be on Adult Swim, and you will see at this point, maybe there are a little bit of similarities between Gentry Chow and what we are about to watch. 
Because now let's go ahead and jump onto the next trailer as we will now go and take a look at the Invincible Fight Girl. In a world where pro wrestling is everything, Saturday, November 2nd at midnight on Toonami, next day on Max, it's showtime. And that was Invincible Fight Girl, to which it will be airing specifically on Toonami on November 2nd, just like the announcer has stated. Now, at this point, maybe now you do understand where I'm coming from with how these two series are actually very similar. It's not just the fact that uh, these two are animated shows, and like I said, the length of them is just over a minute if we don't count the actual stinger right at the end where you would go and see like, oh, now I could go and click here and click here and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but also at the same time, we are talking about two animated series in which they both star a uh, young woman of color with Gentry Chow being Asian, and then you also got uh, Fight Girl being black. And on top of that, they're both very action-packed shows that feature a colorful roster of different antagonists, where you got Gentry Chow fighting against so many different colorful demons, and then you got Invincible Fight Girl, in which um, there are many different wrestlers that um, the Fight Girl has to go and combat against. And uh, it's very interesting to see both of them, and like, coming out at the same time, but also, may I add, there are also some of the pros that are very similar, and I think it is in regards to the animation of both of them, uh, both of which, as you could tell, have a very anime-inspired style, an anime-inspired look to them, uh, especially when it comes to having their action go on. Uh, go on. Uh, I would say maybe more Fight Girl has a bit more of that anime edge, especially when you when we do go back into this. Like you will see every time you see like these um, action shots, or especially with the cinematography, you'll see like all the different like camera angles. They feel very reminiscent to um, uh, to anime, or even like um, like even going back to the very beginning. Like, you see all the different characters that are featured. Like, one thing I'll say right now is that with um, with Invisible Fight Girl, you know what it reminds me a lot of? Ultimate Muscle. Like, this feels very much like a spiritual successor to Ultimate Muscle, including the uh, narrative of uh, the whole series, where you kind of got this aspiring wrestler that's trying to, like, Climb, climb themselves up into the leagues, uh, but instead of um, like the big muscle bound mask guy uh, that we got in Ultimate Muscle, with this one we got Invisible Fight Girl trying to do the same thing. And then you also got uh, Gentry Chow versus the Underworld. If if I may go and swing back onto that one, uh, looking into Gentry Chow, what's interesting with that is. Uh, of course, it's more like um, the kind of action-packed Scooby-Doo kind of thing. Or, you, you know what, speaking of Scooby-Doo, if there is something that this does remind me of, it's more of the, um, like, some of the Kids WB shows, especially some of the more Asian-oriented Kids WB shows. A lot like uh, Jackie Chan Adventures or, um, oh, what, what, what was the one I reviewed? Uh, Shaolin Showdown. Like, it reminds me a little bit, a little bit of that, but except this one is, like, unapologetically more edgy and a little bit more adult like not afraid to be more scary with some of its concepts like with the kids wb stuff they're of course a lot more kid friendly but this one like they ain't afraid to go and freak its audiences out especially to present with like some freaky monsters uh that they will have especially asian based freaky monsters where a lot of them do feel like they could be inspired by uh some asian based myths and lores and stuff like that including uh, especially like a lot of japanese myths as well so you kind of do have that inspiration that's going on especially with the monsters uh, but again, going back to the similarities, they are both, of course, very action-packed, and I think it is safe to say, like, the big appeal for both of them 
are the fights. And um, in in their in their own way, they have like their own different flavors of how they're going to go and present these fights. Where with Invisible Fight Girl, of course, you got a lot of the anime style wrestling uh, that you are going to see like really come to life and promises to even be more dynamic than what you would find in in actual anime where they do depict some uh, some wrestling. Like I can imagine uh, like with Invisible Fight Girl, it may go and uh, have a little bit of a step up in which uh, it wants to do a little bit more than uh, some of the Tiger Masks animes. Uh, and at the same time, so like, like, yeah, you got your wrestling flavor over here with Invisible Fight Girl. Uh, but then with Gentry Chow, of course, it's going to be a lot more supernatural, uh, especially with how uh, Gentry Chow herself, like she has like these incredible powers, like uh, on top here. Let me go and back this up, actually. Like you see over here, Gentry Chow opening, like literally opening up her third eye, having like these incredible fi fire powers, like, yeah, right over here. So it, it, this one is more like the supernatural action that you are going to have with Gentry Chow. But I will say, though, that even though there are a lot of similarities and a lot of differences with both of these uh, animated shows, especially with what they are presenting in this trailer, they both also show some promise. I think it is safe to say that for animation fans, they are going to be eating well at the end of this year, especially with both Gentry Chow and the Invincible Fight Girl. I know that with Fight Girl especially, uh, there is a lot of hype for that show in particular amongst animation fans. I know they are definitely excited for that. And uh, for the most part, with what they are showing in the, in the trailer over here, it looks like uh, there is a chance that it could definitely go and deliver that promise. Uh, but I will say that doesn't mean that we shouldn't overlook Gentry Chow either. That one actually also looks pretty promising. And it really does depend on what you're looking for. If you want to have that supernatural action that is based on Asian myths and stuff like that, then Gentry Chow could actually deliver what you're looking for. If you want something that is more anime-based and you just want some, like, really fun cartoon-like wrestling that takes itself a bit seriously. Maybe not, you know, like, maybe more serious than a Looney Tunes cartoon, but, you know, like, not 100% serious like uh, that Zac Afron wrestling movie. Uh, what was it? Iron Claw? You know, like, don't expect something like that. But still, though, um, it, like, these are things... Yeah, and uh, I, I see the chat wall. Like, I just looked at it. And um, you guys have mentioned, some of you uh, mentioned, like, with, um, uh, especially with Gentry Chow, it's kind of like uh, a spiritual successor to uh, uh, American Dragon Jake Long, or some even say uh, The Life and Times of Juniper Lee. Yeah, that, that is a good comparison. Like, you could see that those similarities. So, like, if you enjoy, like, if you enjoy those action-packed, Asian-based, supernatural animated shows, then Gentry Chow could be another one that you can add to your repertoire to go and check out. And with Invincible Fight Girl, I think that could be another one that animation fans could really eat up and especially see that anime-based wrestling-style action happen. And just, like, having an intense moment one after another. So, once again, I just want to go and clarify... If you are excited for Gentry Chow versus The Underworld, then keep in mind that the series is going to be coming out on Netflix on December 5th. Meanwhile, for The Invincible Fight Girl, if you're excited for that one, then keep in mind that it will be airing on Adult Swim, specifically during Toonami, on November 2nd at midnight, and then the next day it will be airing on Max. All right, so with that said now, I would like to pass on to the chat wall, and I'd like to ask you all, what do you all think about these two trailers with Gentry Chow and Fight Girl? Which ones are you the most impressed or the most excited for? And what did you enjoy or not enjoy from both of them? And at the same time, you know what? Let's go and actually create a poll to make things a little bit more interesting. So um, let me just go and uh, write this. All right, so, uh, which 
are you the most, uh, hold on, the most excited to watch? So let's go and write uh, Jin Tree Chow. And then there's also Invincible Fight Girl. Or it might as well be Jin Tree Chow versus uh, the Underworld. Uh, oops, okay, so, never mind. <laughs> Don't have enough characters to write that, so I'll just write Gentry Chow. All right, so let's go and start this poll. Oh, crap, are you kidding me? Come on. Okay, so unfortunately, I don't think I can do a poll, sadly. Uh, it's, I, I think Twitch is uh, in one of those uh, moods that it just doesn't want to do it, unfortunately. Sorry about that, folks. Here, I'll, I'll go and see... Uh, I'll try uh, one more time, see if uh, actually does work, or is it just, uh... nope, okay, so it doesn't, unfortunately, sorry about that, folks, okay, so, uh, no, so we cannot do a uh, poll, unfortunately, for this one, so, all right, anyways, I'll get back into the chat wall, let me see what you guys have to say, uh, let's see here. Uh, the similarities between Gentry Chow and uh, versus the Underworld and Invisible Fight Girl that they're both action-packed fighting animated shows. They both have the anime style inspired influence animation. They both have girls of a different color as the protagonists. And not only that they're both animated from Titmouse, Gentry Chow I find decent but interesting and Invisible Fight Girl I'm actually interested in. I hope these shows will do well and hope for the best for them. Oh, and there you go. There's another similarity. Uh, it's the fact that they are both from the same animation studio. They're from Titmouse. Or I don't know if it's like specifically the same Titmouse. I don't know if it's like the one, like if it one of them is from Hollywood and the other one is like the Vancouver studio. But still, like it's, it's both under Titmouse that provided the animation. Uh, anyways, uh, what else do we have here? Um, both series look badass and a lot of fun in their own way. If I have to pick one series to watch, then maybe Invincible Fight Girl, since I love the art style and the vibe of the show. It reminds me a bit of Scott Pilgr Pilgrim Takes Off, so it sold me a bit. I might also give Gentry Chow a chance, but let's see which of those shows give me more enjoyment. Can't wait to give those a watch when they come out. All right. Um, I got to say, both of these shows have a lot of promise. They both seem like they could be great action-packed shows with really nice-looking animation. So overall, this seems like a ton of fun. All right. Uh, starting with Gentry Chow, the story has a bit of a Scott, uh, Scott Pilgrim vibe, uh, in which uh, also applies to the humor and the action looks quite fun. Uh, as for Invincible Fight Girl, the narrative has a little been there, done that, but the animation is really cool. Wrestling and an anime style really go in, hand in hand, but the real heroes are the guys at Titmouse. The animation to do uh, both of these has a ton of finesse in their own way, so I'm going to give them a watch. Preferably not at the same time. Well, guess what? You cannot do them at the same time because one is going to be released next month and the other one is coming out in December. So unless you want to save Invincible Fight Girl uh, until December to go and watch both, you kind of can't. So it might as well be best to just go one at a time and start off with Invincible Fight Girl next month and then after that go to Netflix to go and check out Gentry Chow. Uh, let's see what other comments. Um... These new shows remind me of Avatar The Last Airbender cartoon. Overall, I believe these new shows will have great representation in terms of gender and racial diversity. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and already the chat wall is already uh, presenting a brand new battle that's going on. It's apparently me versus Twitch. Uh, well, I mean, we still have a good relationship. It's just that nowadays with Twitch, they just don't care about uh, giving me the polls, you know, to add that additional fun to uh, the podcast. Sadly, like, you, you kind of have to write down, like, if you want to watch one or the other or, like, you know, like, if I would make a poll, then, like, just answer it with your word, sadly. I want to give you less, you know, I want to give you less work to do in order to express some of your opinions, but sadly, uh, they don't want to give me that option right now. Uh, anyways, uh, what other comments would there be? Ah, uh, whoa, there's something about this Invincible Fight Girl thing that just seems to make me think, wait for it, 
Shira and the Princesses of Power, uh, but with an upgrade. I don't know uh, about why, but just seeing that animation makes me think that. The only thing that girl would be missing is a, so uh, is a sword like Adora once used to become Shira. Know what I mean? Honestly, you're not that far off. I, I could see how there is a little bit of that similar style uh, to that series, and we see it here with Gentry Chow. So, honestly, I do get where you're coming from. Like, maybe not the exact same style, but I can see some visual similarities between Gentry Chow and uh, Shira and the Princesses of Power. Uh, let's see now. I'm going to say it straight here. I was generally surprised by both series trailers with Gentry Chow. It looks like an adventurous story with a dark mythology based in Asian culture. As for Invincible Fight Girl, while I have little interest in wrestling, I could see a lot of promise. I could see promise in these both, but I am waiting for the Netflix one mainly because I don't have Max. Well, uh, yeah, that that is fair, but I mean, if you do have um it, like if you do have access to Adult Swim though, you could go and check it out there. It's it's not necessarily like exclusive to streaming. At least with Invincible Fight Girl, it does give you the opportunity to go and watch it on TV before it even comes on streaming. All right, I think uh I think from here I'll go and read one more comment before we go and uh move on to our first break. Let's see. As someone who grew up with action cartoons ba uh, back in the 2000s, like for WB, Disney, and for kids, I am excitedly curious. I'm going to see how it is. Both of them are animated at Titmouse, and it has a reputation in making action and uh, in making action animation. All right, so. Uh, it looks like there is a lot of interest for both. Uh, rather, if uh, people are more excited for either Gentry Chow or Invincible Fight Girl, I mean, that is honestly very debatable, and I can't do a poll to go and like actually prove it. Uh, but still, though, there is definitely hype for both, and a lot of promise for both as well. So... If you are excited to go, once again, just to remind you all, if you are excited for both series, then keep in mind, Gentry Chow vs. The Underworld is coming out on Netflix on December 5th, and Invincible Fight Girl is going to be coming out on Adult Swim on November, t on November 2nd at midnight, and then the day afterwards, it will be on Max. All right, so we're going to go on to our first break, and when we do come back, we are going to go and check out one trailer this time. But this one, though, uh, oddly enough, they didn't call it a trailer, but rather a special look. So what makes this look so special? Well, we're going to go we're going to go go and find out as um, and uh, after we will be right back from this. All right, welcome back. Now, for our next story, we have a special special look to get into and when i say special look i mean that we have another trailer to go and check out i know it's weird to call it a special look per se because in reality this is just another trailer but then again this is something that disney would go and often do where sometimes they will go and call their trailers a special look after they would go and release the uh, official trailer it's it, like it, it has happened from time to time let's just say it's not our first time uh seeing disney putting out a special look oh and by the way uh speaking of disney i just want to go and quickly mention this i forgot to do so in the opening but uh i just want to go and give a special shout out to um uh, uh, my peeps in Florida or anybody who has been affected by the recent hurricanes, such as Hurricane Milton and Hurricane Helen. I know like it is definitely freaky to be facing those, but I hope that uh, like uh, you you guys have uh, been recovering since that time. It's like I understand that those kinds of natural disasters can be very frightening to face, but Hopefully, in the in the long run, you'll be able to go and recover, and that right now you are okay as is, and that maybe the hurricane didn't do too much damage uh, to to anything that's happening in your life, whether it be like if it affected your family or if it, if it affected your home or anything like that. So I just want to go and send my love to uh, uh, the pe the people who have been affected or uh, injured both Hurricane Milton and Hurricane Helen. But anyways, back on to what I was talking about. Yes, the special look. 
So why don't we go and actually liven things up and uh, let's bring the mood back up by checking out the special look of the upcoming animated sequel, Moana 2. Yeah. And that is Moana 2, to which the movie is going to be coming out in theaters on November 27th. Now, one thing I do want to say is that with the previous Moana trailers, I gotta admit that as much as I want to be optimistic for the film, there, there was a lot of hesitancy because... From what I've seen in those trailers, I wasn't sure like how the movie was going to be. I felt like it wasn't necessarily showing enough to give me an idea of what this movie is going to be, who these who these new characters are, or anything like that. It is like there there's a lot of like things that I just feel like eh, I don't know. Like maybe it's just not showing the best clips for it. Rather it be uh the teaser trailer from uh when the announcement was still fresh or even like the recent D23 trailer. You know, they weren't necessarily great to go and represent what Moana 2 is. But then came the special look. Like then this came out this week to show what this movie is going to be, or at least give us a better idea. And I gotta say, man, this is actually pretty dope. I'm not gonna lie. Th you know, this is honestly what I've been asking for. This is what I want to see. A little bit more of an idea of what the plot is going to be, how the tone is going to be, uh, more of an idea of who these characters are, and even the songs. Like, honestly, like, now we're getting more and more of an idea of how Moana 2 is gonna be like, and so far, it is very promising. I mean, already you got the animation itself that looks fantastic. Like, the animation is already awesome. We've already seen a whole bunch from the previous trailers. Of course, like we saw, like, the opening of that giant clan that's very detailed. But now with this, like, we see even more of uh, what the animation can do or what is going to provide. Especially when it comes to the more antagonistic characters. Now, one thing I do want to point out, because some people say that, okay, now Moana 2 actually has uh, a definitive villain. Um, and uh, I think it's, um, like, one of the angry gods specifically uh, that they showed. I just want to go and see uh, if we could go and actually find it. Yeah, like... Uh, yeah, I, I, I forgot her name. I think they already announced it. Uh, Chatwall, you could go and actually uh, tell me uh, who she is. But, like, a lot of people are pointing to her as, like, the possible new villain of uh, Moana 2. But based on what we have seen here, like, with all the different monsters and mentioning that there are angry gods coming out of here, uh, I kind of feel like it could be a similar case to the first Moana where... Uh, yeah, okay, so apparently she is called, uh, Ma uh, Matangi. Kind of weird that she also has, uh, the first same, th first same three letters as I do, okay. Uh, uh, voiced by Ahi, uh, Auhimai Fraser. Okay, <laughs> okay, I see, I see. Yeah, so a lot of people are pointing to her as the villain, but I think, like, from what I'm seeing, there is a possibility that I think it's gonna be, like, the first Moana, where it's gonna be, like, each scene is going to have a villain than like a set main antagonist throughout this whole thing. Or at least like the main antagonist won't be appearing as much similar to uh, Tefiti in, um, in uh, the first Moana film. So in the first one, like along with Tefiti, like we got the Kakamura, we got Tamatoa and all that stuff. And then with this one here, like, yeah, we got Matangi, but then we also got the return of, of the Kakamura. And then of course, like we also got another angry God over here that's preventing the people to go into the village. And uh, this also brings, and, and also, uh, since I was talking about the animation, one thing I did enjoy is uh, when we do see, like, uh, where was it? Like, over here, where we would see, like, all the different sea monsters that are going to be coming in, which honestly, 
I'm definitely hyped up for. I'm definitely curious to see because it is true that they did hint out like there's a bunch of sea monsters in the world of Moana, especially when they come from the same area that Tamatoa lives. So, of course, we're going to have a lot more of those. And especially if the angry gods are going to be sending their arsenal, uh, like they're going to be using them as their minions to go against uh, Moana and her crew. And already, like, some of the designs, like, they already look fun, they look colorful, they look bright. Honestly, like, they, you know, th th this looks like something that the animators uh, would definitely exercise their creativity with uh, to go and present them in action. And also, uh, one thing that I do want to mention like, that I really appreciate from this trailer is that now we know about these new characters. We now are familiar with who they actually are. And, uh, like, of course, like, the main new character that they presented is Moana's little sister. So we do have, like, uh, that, that, that cuteness factor into here. Like, uh, of course, like, a big selling point to the first Moana is when uh, she was a baby and first interacting with the ocean. But now, that mantle will be passed on to her little sister, carrying on that cuteness uh, that she can have with her bonding moments with Moana. And yeah, like, even times like this, like, uh, I, I will admit, like, a, a big highlight is, like, uh, right over here. I could go, but I won't be with you. So you can take a piece from home. <laughs> like, I gotta admit, like, that little moment right there, that was absolutely sweet. Uh, so yeah, like, she, like, you got that main new character, uh, but on top of that, you do have the others as well, uh, that we do have a little bit of an idea now of who they are. They aren't just, like, random people from Moana's village that were just luckily chose uh, that were luckily chosen uh, to go on her adventure. Like, now we got a bit of an idea. I'm gonna need a crew. Sweet! A farmer on the sea! Yes! I'm going with Moana! Woo! Like, now we got a little bit of a hint of their personalities and what they can offer as an extra onto the movie itself, including a bit of their backgrounds of what they would go and do. So that uh, honestly is um, pretty nice right there. So that's, uh, you know, uh, honestly, it's like, okay, so now I could see like there is a reason why we could be on board with these characters and that like they will add their own flavor to the adventure and a bit of their own memorability as well, you know? So, it, it, you know, it's not just Moana and Maui again. Now we got like the addition of these characters uh, that are joining in. Uh, but then also, I gotta say, if there is one thing that honestly really sold me on this, and what honestly, it's it's something that even right now, I don't see that many people talking about, but it's showing a lot of promise, debatably the most promise of them all in this trailer, even pr probably even more than the animation, are the songs. Like, yeah, the songs are definitely in the background, you just hear them on the side. But from what I'm hearing so far, oh yeah, they uh, they sound like they share that same gravitas, that same power that we got like in the first film. Yes, a lot of people have noted that Lin-Manuel Miranda is not going to be available for Moana 2, considering that he was busy uh, producing both The Warriors, uh, which is his own uh, like personal upcoming project, and of course providing the music for Mufasa as well. But the two other songwriters of Moana are still on board with this. You know, they're still providing that same music to keep that same spirit onto the new songs here. And what we have been hearing so far, let's just have like a, a little bit of another listen over here. Like, uh, especially like near the end, like just have uh, that little taste. Bigger than us. The entire ocean is counting on us. Oh, that, like, that is awesome. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if this is going to be, like, another case of uh, what we have seen with Frozen and Frozen 2, where suddenly, like, we will have, like, these major musical numbers, and especially Moana herself, like, yeah, she got her big musical moment with How Far I'll Go in the first one, but then in the second, 
we will see another that could show up that like honestly will be like even bigger than what they set up before so honestly there's just so much that i am seeing in this trailer that like they're really nailing again and again and again and honestly so far this is providing a lot of promise and not to mention i have even noticed that even the internet seems to be pretty optimistic as well because for once unlike many of the uh, of the uh, of the recent disney films that we've had we don't have trolls that's just bombarding with hate on this or just review bombing even like with um like if you look over here like with the ratio of um of like likes and dislikes like this is shockingly tame like i you know honestly after everything like after like with all the disney live action remakes strange world wish and stuff like that like for once we are seeing like the you know the likes and dislikes where like the grand majority or almost all, all of it is pretty much positive so in that regards like it, it, it's showing me a lot of hope with what is to come with moana 2 yes there are definitely a bunch of movies that are going to be coming for the rest of the year but i think uh, moana 2 is already being is already getting in shape to become one of the most anticipated films uh that's going to be coming for the rest of this year and maybe even a strong competitor against the other movies that are going to be coming out at that same time, like Gladiator 2 and especially the Wicked movie. So that is going to be exciting to see. And overall, once again, I just want to say um, I am so glad to have seen this special look of Moana 2 because now it gives me a clear idea of how this is going to be without showing all of the surprises. Because on top of the animation looking great, you know, I got a clear idea of who these characters are and how I may actually enjoy them during this movie. Um, there's also the action that looks pretty promising and especially the soundtrack is sounding great so far. So overall, yeah, I am definitely excited for Moana 2 right now and it's about time that I can confidently say so. So if you are excited to go and check out Moana 2, then keep in mind that the movie shall be coming out later this year on November 27th. And with that said, now I would like to go into the chat wall and I'd like to ask you all, what do you all think about the special look of Moana 2? Did you guys enjoy, enjoy this one? Are you guys a little bit hesitant? Do you still have questions about what may be to come in this sequel? Let me know what you all think about this. All right. Um, as someone who really loves the first Moana, this trailer looks awesome. This definitely seems like it could be a worthy sequel, even if it was supposed to originally be a Disney Plus series. The visuals are just gorgeous, the new characters seem interesting, and the songs seem like they're going to be great. So overall, I'm very excited for this. However, if a certain crab doesn't appear, I'm sure it'll make a certain animation YouTuber very upset. Well, I mean, <laughs> if not... That'll be his problem. Uh, anyways, um, as someone who grew up with the first Moana film, I am excited to see the sequel on the big screen. I do love the animation, the action looks cool, and the songs are very good. Moana's sister is adorable, and the villain Matangi does look scary and intimidating. My theory she could be Maui's crazy sister. That is just my fan theory. Um, I don't know, honestly. Well, I mean, like, we are technically talking about gods and stuff like that, so... Uh, and considering that Moana does have a reputation of being very respectful to Polynesian culture and Oceanic culture as well, maybe there could be that kind of connection, but that would require, like, you know, looking into um, Polynesian myths and lore to see, like, if there is that kind of connection between Matangi and Maui. Uh, let's see now. Uh, I gotta say, with this special look at the trailer from uh, from the call of Maui, Charlie! Now I feel like I want to give Disney a chance with this sequel. The animation looks hyper, Matangi looks like a prominent villain that could surpass King Magnifico, and the story looks enticing. However, that blue work-like monster looks like it was made from AI, but it does look amazing. Well, I mean, most likely, I'm just gonna say, 
Probably not. Uh, anyways, uh, and not only that, we finally get to see a boat snack and boat snack upgrade, or should I say bacon and eggs? <laughs> All right, let's see now. I wouldn't say I'm a hundred percent. I wouldn't say I'm a hundred percent impressed by this trailer, but I am like ninety-two percent impressed. The humor does go a little, hey, remember this from the first movie? For my taste. But the animation is still gorgeous. Matangi looks like a sick villain. And the music sounds quite nice. I'm going to give this a watch. But my big hope is that Matangi gets a villain song. It may not be as good as Shiny, but it can't get worse than this is the thanks I get. Well, I mean, debatably, I would say it could. I mean, hey, like either way. It wouldn't be like that freaking yodeling song in um, in uh, Home on the Range. I'm just saying. Like, if you want to talk about legit bottom of the barrel Disney villain songs, no one can get worse than that. I'll take this is the thanks I get any day of the week compared to that guy forsaken uh, yodeling song in freaking Home on the Range. Okay, uh, let's see what we got here. Uh, so far, I'm, I am still remaining optimistic about this, along with next year's Zootopia sequel. Also, while it's a pity that Ron Clements and John Musker aren't returning as original directors, I'm willing to give this a chance with the new leader and songwriters, as well as the animation team outside of Burbank, like how I did with the new director of Inside Out 2. Personally, I'm looking forward to seeing more of Pua, who didn't get that much previously. Yeah, I, I, honestly, I do agree. I feel like this is going to be something that, um, like, hopefully, uh, the you know, like, Pua will have a more prominent role, or at least justify why he's been so marketed uh, from Disney, despite the fact that his appearance of the first can, like, almost be considered a cameo. So, yeah, hopefully, like, he'll be given, a, a, like, a, a more legitimate role, or at least, like, a more prominent role. Anyways, after watching this trailer, I can bet that Moana 2 will be another billion dollar hit for Disney, especially for countries outside of North America where Moana is very popular. Also, the relationship between Moana and her sister reminds me of Mirabelle and Antonio from Encanto. That is honestly a fair comparison, and I could see a little bit of that similarities, uh, actually. Like, that is true, and I mean, like, Disney has done... A great job with those kinds of relationships so maybe we will see that magic be recreated again in Moana 2 with her and uh, her sister anyways uh, let's see now who's uh, who's to say no one could be excited after that I, I was already curious after the first trailer but this pretty much elevated it in theory uh, I wonder if the excited person is uh, the dancing boy from the first movie overall the excitement is growing to know how they will present this the creativity the viewpoints and the songs uh, barely heard much yet but it really sounds great it's a definitive yes for me to see it this year. <laughs> awesome. I, I don't know. Like, I know there have been some time that has passed between the first and the second. I mean, if it's enough time for Moana's parents to go and actually produce a sister who is at the point where she seems like a bit of that toddler age that she could still talk and stuff like that. You know, at that point, uh, I don't know. I don't know if it's like that much time that has legitimately passed where that dancing kid in the first could like have that bigger role to join Moana's team. All right, I think I'm going to read, um, I think I'll read one more until we can, uh, or two more, yeah, maybe two more actually, before we will go and uh, go on to our next break and our next story. Anyways, uh, ciao! Ooh, uh, the movie does look like it's trying to offer a lot of new things, a new adventure, new characters, new challenges, a new story, and that there is not all and that there is not always easy to come up with. Uh, whatever story this movie is going to try to offer, I feel like it either has to be original or just to be the same sto story told in a different way. That's the part I feel concerned with the movie like this. Yeah, I, I, like honestly, um <laughs> Oh, did someone put, did I say something wrong? Actually, apparently I might, I, I, I don't know if this is true. Apparently I said politician than Polynesian. If I did, I'm sorry for the uh, mistake right over there. Uh, anyways, um, yeah, I, no, but 
I, I do understand the concern. And uh, honestly, there have been a lot of movies or a lot of sequels that I've seen where they would go into the lazy route and they would try to just rehash the first, but like in a little bit of a different way. And yeah, like that writing right there is just absolutely lazy. But I mean, we'll see with what they do with uh, the first Moana. And I, and I understand that so far, we are seeing some similarities in terms of the story with uh, Moana going on an adventure and stuff like that. But uh, hopefully by the time the movie does come out, we will see uh, some notable differences as well. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, the two trailers that we got before didn't really show a lot of what this sequel is going to offer, uh, which makes me not that hyped for it. But thanks to this trailer, I am now more excited for Moana 2. It gave me more context of what it's going to be about. The visuals are amazing and the songs are pretty good. As, uh, someone who liked the first as, as someone who liked the first as a child, I'll definitely keep an eye out for Moana 2. All right, you know, it is actually great to see that um, now we, you know, there's a lot of hype going on for Moana 2. Things are looking very promising that Disney Animation could actually pick themselves back up. And there's now a higher probability that with Moana 2, it's not going to meet the same fate as either Strange World or Wish. So in that regards... If you are excited to go and check out Moana 2, then keep in mind that it will be coming soon to theaters on November 27th. And with that said, we're going to go on to our next break. And when we do come back, we got one more trailer that we are going to watch. And I would say, debatably, this could probably be the best one, even compared to the ones that we have seen. I mean, like, so far, like, with all three trailers we have watched so far, they've been very promising. Oh, but I got to say that my hype is definitely going to be with this one, which is already part of one of my most anticipated films of 2025. All right, welcome back, everyone. Now we do have one more trailer that we are going to go and check out. And this is going to be from one of my favorite independent animators, Sylvain Chaumet. Now, when it comes to Sylvain Chaumet, his latest work, well, let's just say it's not as liked as his other movies, like with either um, The Triplets of Belleville or The 2010 Illusionist, considering that he provided the opening cartoon for Joker Folie à deux. And uh, as you have seen right now, it is already heading towards to becoming the, the biggest disaster, or at least one of the biggest disasters of 2024. But I will say though that uh, from people who have seen it, I've seen many of them actually state that one of the best parts or possibly the best part of that movie is the opening that Sylvain Chaumet and his team created, which goes to show and uh, puts out an undeniable statement that Sylvain Chaumet is a better filmmaker than Todd Phillips. But we're not going to be talking about Joker Folie à deux. Instead, we are going to be talking about his next project. Uh, we are going to be talking about Sylvain Chaumet's next animated feature that he has in store. And already, we have a teaser trailer to go and see what he has prepared for us for his next motion picture. And that is actually none other than the magnificent life of Marcel Pignol. So let's go and check out the teaser trailer right over here. Becoming a writer. There are promises that are easier made than kept. And that is The Magnificent Life of Marcel Pe uh, Pagnol, which is uh, a biographical feature that is based on the real-life filmmaker and playwright. Now, to give you a little bit more of an idea of what is in store with this movie, my source here on uh, Animation Magazine did put out the synopsis, in which it states here... Uh, in 1955, 60-year-old Marcel Pagnol is a well-known and acclaimed playwright and filmmaker. When the editor-in-chief of Elle magazine commissions a weekly column about Pagnol's childhood, he sees this as a great opportunity to go back to his artistic roots, writing. 
Realizing his memory is failing him and deeply affected by the disappointing results of his last two plays, Pagnol starts doubting his abilities to pursue his work. That is until little Marcel, the young boy he used to be, appears to him, uh, to him as if by magic. Together they will explore Marcel Pagnol's incredible life, his successes and failures, his joys and sorrows. His, uh, the journey of an artist from a young teacher in province to a true pioneer of talking movies, an exceptional inventor who built his own film studio and held out through World War II, a self-made man who never betrayed his free spirit or independence, even less his values and origins, a simple man and a bon vivant above all. Now, there is one unfortunate catch when it comes to the magnificent life of Marcel Pagnol is that you would have to really wait until this movie does come out because, yeah, I, I wouldn't even say that we got extremely lucky that we had the teaser trailer right now because according to my source, it looks like it's not going to be coming out until literally next year, where it's going to be having its premiere in France on October 15th of 2025, while the North American release is going to be sometime uh, at the end of 2025, or more specifically, the fourth quarter of 2025, which will be distributed by Sony Pictures Classics. Now, when is that going to be coming out? That I am honestly not so sure. But I gotta say, based on what we have seen here with uh, the teaser trailer of The Magnificent Life of Marcel Pagnol, that I am already excited. I have done reviews of both of his movies with um, uh, The Illusionist several years ago and uh, not too long ago, a few months ago with uh, The Triplets of Belleville. And his works are absolutely magnificent. Some of the most beautiful hand-drawn animation that you will find in the 21st century, especially with... Um, with uh, the triplets of Belleville, which to be honest, the more I think about it, the more that it becomes like not just one of my favorite independent animated features, but also one of my favorite animated films, period. It is that great. It is that enjoyable. And it's really that awesome. And based on what we have seen with the magnificent life of Marcel Pagnol, like, we are getting another of his works, and we see that kind of artistry. Like, even before, like, I'm not going to lie, I did see online a little bit of the cartoon that he produced with um, with uh, uh, Joker Folia Deux. And that one, like, of course, like, it leaned in a little bit more to the Looney Tunes style than what uh, than what Sylvain Man would regularly do uh, with his own works. But this one feels like a return to true form. This feels like we are back to um, what we love from uh, from Sylvain Chaumet. Like the animation style that they provide, it's like, it's smooth. It, you know, it has that signature artistic look to it. Um, like the designs are fantastic. The backgrounds are just so detailed. And even the color palette, like it, it feels like it transports you back to an older time in Europe. Like it, it like I'll, I know it sounds weird, but it does have this very European color palette that is a lot more rustic, but there is something that's also realistic at the same time that makes it immersive as well. But I will say the one thing that this one so far feels like it really does stand out compared to the other Sylvain Chaumet movies or some of the other works that he has done is that this one seems to lean a lot more into having a lot more dialogue. When you look into both the triplets of Belleville and the uh, 2010 Illusionist film, like those ones were mostly silent. They're the kinds that allow the animation to be in charge of the storytelling, to let uh, the characters' expressions and their movements to go and dictate what this film is about, more so than any dialogue uh, that would be mentioned. And even at that, like, the most dialogue that would come out of those features, like, they sound a little bit more like mumblings that don't necessarily matter. It's not about what they say, it's about what they do. But in this one, on the other hand, I feel like it's a 
bit more different. Like you hear a lot of characters uh, that are talking in here. Like a lot of people that are going to be uh, communicating. Like just to go back uh, uh, a little bit like um, o over. Yeah, like uh, let's just go like right over here. Hold on, let's put up the volume at least. I don't want you to write just any old thing about us. Because wherever you went, I went. Like, yeah, the, so the dial so in this case here, the dialogue is going to be playing a far bigger role. And it does make sense, actually, considering that when you do think about the life of uh Marcel Pagnol. He is a guy in which, um, you know, like w one of the things that he is most well known for is to advance the talkies during the early 20th century. Like the reason why uh, now movies have sound and why characters have dialogue on film, uh, a big part of it, I wouldn't say it's because of Marcel Pagnol, but he did play a very significant role as to why. So I'm sure like with dialogue and having characters talking, that should play a little bit more of an important role in the feature more so than what Sylvain Chaumet would go and regularly do uh, with his works. But one thing I will say that I'm really excited for is the creative approach that they are doing with the life of Marcel Pagnol, especially when you do see um, like the reunion of both uh, the old Marcel and the young Marcel, or like uh, a spiritual version of the young Marcel Pagnol. This, I feel like it is absolutely fantastic and uh, quite a coincidence for me personally, because this, like what you are seeing right over here, this feels very much like therapy talk. This is very much that people who go to therapy, they would go and, um, you know, they would go and experience that they would have to go and recontact their inner child to go and confront their personal problems that they have held on the inside for quite some time. And I say this because this is what I'm going to, uh, this is what I'm kind of going through right now. This is what me and my therapist have been talking about for quite some time to go and like, um, if ever I would have any like emotional problems or uh, trying to deal like with any like stressful uh, issues or anxieties and stuff like that, like these are the moments that I would have to go and like have to have a chat with my younger self to talk about like, hey, what's wrong? And to show a little bit more love to that younger side. And it feels like with over here, we're kind of seeing this as well, where the life of Marcel Pagnol is going to be told by himself, but he also has his younger self there to be an advisor for him, for the younger self to go and like reflect back on what his older, you know, like to look back onto the life and how he, how the younger self have felt throughout this entire thing. So in a way, it's going to be from, like, it's going to be about the life of Marcel Pagnol, but from the perspective of both the older Marcel Pagnol and the younger self of Marcel Pagnol. So yes, there is that factor that in this film, mental health does play a significant factor. It does play a pretty important role where in a way, it's not just about uh, his contribution to uh, to talking movies and, pl and playwrights and stuff like that, but it's also uh, Marcel Pagnol's own, own exercise on, foc on examining his own mental health throughout the whole thing. And I can imagine, uh, considering that he did live throughout um, the early 20th century, I can imagine there's been a lot of like crazy stresses, like when dealing with big successes and major failures, or especially going through World War II, where you get the Nazis spreading their evil across the world. So there is that factor as well. So overall, I got to say that with this trailer right over here, I am absolutely excited for this. Already this, along with Zootopia 2, are already among 
among my most anticipated movies of next year. Not just the animated films, but just movies in general. This feels like a, a return of Sylvain Chomet in his true form that we are going to be getting another great and beautiful hit similar to The Illusionist and The Triplets of Belleville, but of course, with something that is fresh, something that is new as well. So we got both the familiarity and Sylvain Chomet trying out new things with his filmmaking skills, and I'm definitely hyped up for it. Now, I will say that I do accept the fact that there is a possibility that Maybe it's going to be a little bit more than a while that I'm going to go and watch this. Yes, the initial release, at least in North America, is going to be somewhere in the second, in the fourth quarter of 2025. So by the end of it. But honestly, I would not be surprised that in my case personally, maybe I might end up checking it out like in the beginning of 2026, like in the first quarter of 2026, maybe. But who knows, maybe I'll get lucky and I'll see it in 2025. But for those of you um, who want to go and really watch it, then keep in mind, yes, it will be released at that time at the end of 2025 somewhere. Or if you just so happen to be in France, then keep in mind that it will be coming out in those theaters on October 15th of next year. All right, so with that said and done, now I would like to go into the chat wall again, and I'd like to ask you all, what did you all think about the teaser trailer of The Magnificent Life of Marcel Pagnol? Are you guys excited to go and check this out? Are, are there some things that you are curious about? Let me know what you all think about this. All right, let's see. Uh, the movie, uh, the movie does look interesting. The animation style looks great. I think the movie is set in, uh, World War II because it had one scene that we had Hitler in it. Yes, it is. I mean, it is, like I said, it is mostly going to be during the first half of, of the 20th century. So it will cover World War II. Not, it won't mainly be World War II, like with, uh, Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio, but like there will be a part of it that will be said during that time. Uh, anyways, uh, blah, 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 blah. Um, I think it's going to have a great time for the European audiences to see this movie. And overall, I'm not sure if I'm going to watch this movie. Also, speaking of Europeans, I heard that Armin is restructuring after losing $720,000 last year, cutting 20 uh, of its uh, 20 stuff and it's losing their jobs. Hopefully, Wallace and Gromit movie is going to be okay. Yeah, just like a quick side note to go and mention that, yes, I am aware that things have not been looking great for Armin Animation, that, yeah, they did lose a significant amount of money, and they also had to go and cut down jobs. At least it's not as extreme as, like, when we would hear Hollywood studios do that as well. It's only 20, it's only 20 jobs that were lost, but still, though, uh, that does suck for those people, and I do wish those uh, to, you know, I do wish those people who did, uh, lose their jobs all the best and that hopefully they can get back on their feet soon. And, uh, hopefully th uh, also with Armin animation that they could go and, uh, pick themselves up as well, because it would be quite a tragedy to, to lose that studio as well. I know nowadays stop motion is not as popular as what it used to be, but you know, hopefully we will see, you know, hopefully that they as well can have things better and that, Maybe with the upcoming Wallace and Gromit movie that, you know, things can look, you know, things can hopefully become better for them. Anyways, uh, back on to Marcel Pagnol. Uh, anything Sylvain Chomet does will definitely be something special to see because of how phenomenally well, uh, that he makes his animated films. Uh, The Magnificent Life of Marcel Pagnol is doing something I've never seen in any Sylvain Chomet film before. It has dialogue. Uh, I hopefully, uh, I honestly do hope the dialogue is well written, though. Sure, it's a long wait, but I know it's going to be short, uh, a shorter wait compared to Frozen 3. Uh, I know that film won't be out in a while as well and this film is right around the corner <laughs> yeah i mean we got to be patient for this one but so far from what we have seen it's looking great like i i won't even say promising because like honestly like especially because it's from Sylvain Chomet, there's a high likelihood that those promises are going to be kept uh but anyways um as someone getting familiar with Sime Chomez animated works, uh, as I'm not, I'm not only looking forward to see his return since he did get 
a thousand miles off the ground since 2016, uh, but for more hand-drawn animation, especially after Hayao Miyazaki's The Boy and the Heron. Also, it's just a theory, but maybe his project, as I previously mentioned, got canceled because Shoman wanted to break away uh, from the silence for a change. I mean... I, well, I don't know. Like, again, like, it's just a theory, so there's no confirmation if it's true or not. But, I mean, I understand how it is true that it, like, it's been quite a long time since we've had a legitimate animated feature from, uh, from Sylvain Chaumet. Like, the time between Marcel Pagnol and The Illusionist, you know, like, it's been, like, over a decade at least. I think, Or, like, almost 50, or, like, what, 15 years or something like that? Uh, so, yeah, like, maybe there might be a reason why we haven't seen him done any, like, major work. Like, yeah, there were, like, a few small stuff, like, what we have seen with Joker Fuddy Adur or even, like, with The Simpsons, for example, like, with that one couch gag. Uh, but still, though... From uh, 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 still seeing him return, like it feels great. And honestly, I think like a big part of it is actually making this film because I am aware that when it comes to the magnificent life of Marcel Pagnol, this has been in production for like several years. I, I, I don't think like it's been like 10 years since he's been, he's been making it, but like, you know, it's been quite some time, like several years, over five at least, uh, that he has been working on this picture. So at least like with this, we know why uh, he's been making, you know, like why he's been like pretty quiet for quite some time. And it's because, you know, he's been doing this. All right. Uh, let's see. This trailer definitely looks impressive. As someone who does appreciate the works of Sylvain Chaumet, this definitely looks like another solid hit from him. The story is definitely interesting, and the animation is really nice. So overall, I think this definitely has potential. And on a side note, as someone who did unfortunately see Joker 2, I can confirm the animated opening was the best part of the movie. Ah, <laughs> there you go. Uh, someone mentioned, I thought Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio took place during World War One. No, 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 no. It's definitively World War Two. Like, the Nazi imagery is very prominent. I mean, like, even, um, Mussolini was, like, a, a legitimate character in the film. So I think, that, like, that's a major clue well, of when the time period was. Hold on a sec. <coughs> Just needed that out of my system. Uh, anyways, let's see uh, any other uh, comments going on. Uh, Sylvain Chaumet has been a masterclass in his uh, native France. And with this third film, it looks great. And Sylvain is a great guy when it comes to European animation. While I have no plans to see this, I might have to check out uh, the other films by Chaumet first. I wish Chaumet all the luck on this film and his next one. Oh, absolutely. If you guys have not seen either The Triplets of Belleville or the 2010 Illusionist film, please do so. They are amazing features and some of the best independent animated movies that you will find today. Like, honestly, fantastic. Uh, I honestly do consider them must-watch as animated films. All right. Uh, anyways, uh, let's see where where do we have here. Um, as someone who has not seen any of Sylvain Chaumet's films, I am definitely interested to see this film. After watching The Boy and the Heron in theaters, I'll bet in the English dub, uh, as it was the only one available in my area, I made a plan to watch international films, live action or animated, whenever I can. One question, do you recommend Chomez films, The Trumpets of Belleville, and The Illusionist? Um, if it hasn't been clear throughout this whole segment, yes, absolutely. Go and check them out. Like, the, the, like they are honestly, like, I would even say, at best, they are masterpieces in their own right. And I've already mentioned uh, of, like, how much I love The Triplets of Belleville. So please, check them out when you can. All right, uh, I think I'm going to read one more comment, and then we're going to go on to... Uh, the next break and the next story. It looks absolutely gorgeous. The animation is lovely and the music is ear pleasing. I haven't watched any of Sylvain Chaumet, but I did watch your review of the triplets of Belleville and I will admit the animation is amazing. Regardless, I can't wait to see what Chaumet has got in store next year. Absolutely. So, if you are curious to go and check out The Magnificent Life of Marcel Pagnol, then keep in mind that France is going to be getting it first on October 15th of 2025, and also, it will be coming out sometime in North America during the final quarter of 2025. Maybe closer to the holiday season, maybe a little bit earlier, 
but we'll have to wait and see. But either way, it looks absolutely amazing so far. Now, we are going to go on to our next break. And when we do come back, we will be getting back into some animation news. And this time around, we will be looking at the end of what is uh, probably the most talked about animated series in recent years. But maybe not for the right reason, so stay tuned for that. Alright, welcome back. Now, when it comes to our next story, we got all the trailers complete, and now we are going to return to animation news. And when it comes to this one, oh boy, did it get some strong reactions. In fact, throughout its lifespan, it received nothing but strong reactions. But it looks like its time on streaming is about to end, or at the very least, there won't be any more continuations, especially when it wasn't that long ago that we have received the holiday special. But either way, regardless of how you may feel, it is official now. It's over. Yes, Warner Brothers Discovery and Max have confirmed that the adult animated Scooby-Doo series Velma has officially been canceled after two seasons. Now, this was honestly very interesting because um, the first time that this was actually reported was not from these news articles directly coming from uh, the studios themselves, but rather it was, uh, I believe, a background artist in which he put out a clue that uh, apparently Velma might have been canceled. And of course, people reacted very strongly towards that and uh, they pretty much took it to say that Velma is over, it's canceled, and all that kind of stuff. Now, that same background artist, they end up deleting their posts and try to put out a clarification that it's actually because they were not aware of what Velma's future could be. If there was going to be a season three or anything like that, they just don't actually know. You know, they just wanted to put out their statement in terms of what's happening with their job and questioning if they will continue working on the Velma series. Like, it's mainly just, like, ma making those kinds of wonders that people immediately read as, like, an official announcement that it was canceled. But it wasn't until uh, news articles decided to go and contact both Warner Brothers Discovery and Max directly to go and confirm if that is true, and they actually said yes. After two seasons and a Halloween special, they are going to be canceling Velma. In fact, uh, we actually do have some quotes, or just one quote here, uh, coming from Max, or a spokesperson from Max, uh, to which they have stated... Over the past two seasons, Mindy Kaling and Charlie Grandy have created an incredibly fun and fresh world within the iconic Hood, uh, hood, hood Unit franchise, or, or the Who Done It franchise. Sorry, I did not read that. I, I did not read that correctly. <laughs> uh, anyways, while we won't be moving forward with another series uh, season of the series, we thank them for their compelling coming of age storytelling, unrivaled clues, and hilarious hijinks. Uh, did we have another? Oh, we actually do have another, uh, quote. Oh, no, no, that's not a quote. Uh, sorry about that, folks. Okay, that's just a continuation to go and discuss about, um, like, some of the people who have worked on it. Of course, you did get Mindy Kaling, uh, who is both an executive producer and, uh, playing the voice of Velma herself. Uh, but this was mainly developed by, uh, someone by the name of Charlie Grandy. And yeah, from there, uh, it looks like there won't be any more Velma that's going to be coming out. Now, one thing that I just want to go and make things clear, I just want to go and get it out of the way. I do understand the sentiments regarding Velma, and I am not going to be to get I'm not going to be taking anyone's opinion away from that series. And I do get it. Yeah, the show is not good. It sucked. And it could debatably be said that it's one of the worst things to ever come out of the Scooby-Doo franchise, one of the worst animated uh, adult animated series in recent years, or maybe one of the worst animated series in recent years. Like, in terms of those opinions, how people feel about that, I'm not going to take that away from you at all. I get it. But I gotta say, though, it's the level of hate that is honestly overwhelming. I would even go as far and say that I don't think there has ever been an animated show or any animated project 
that has received this level of intense hatred than Velma. And keep in mind, I have been doing this for several years now. I've been doing it for about 15 years, and I've seen the animation community go rampant and go savage on a variety of different animated projects. Rather it be stuff like the Emoji Movie, or Teen Titans Go, or some of the seasons of uh, like modern SpongeBob or whatever, the, or The Simpsons and what have you, I have seen people throw in absolutely so much hate on different kinds of animated projects, but never on the scale of Velma. And that, honestly, I would debate, maybe it might have been a little too intense, or at least a little too intense for my taste, where people, like, honestly, like, there, there's a fine line between hating it and then, like, hating it with an absolute passion. Like, honestly, I, I feel like there is a fine line on like how much hate can you go and deliver a cartoon? And some people decided that they want to go and take it to the next level where like, like every anger that they have in their own fiber being to just unleash it onto this one animated series. Like there's a fine line between being mad at an animated show like Velma and being mad at it as if it really did something personal to you. Like, that's the kind of anger that I have often seen from people. Like, they're mad at, like, the way that they're mad at Velma, it's almost as if, like, that Mindy K Kaling Velma did something personal to them that they cannot accept and that they want to hold that John Wick-style grudge and vendetta against them. Like, honestly... But when they're like when it comes to Velma, there are some people who are so mad at them, it's almost as if they would go and walk into their room and they would see Velma get, you know, like Velma getting laid with their partner. That they're just writing their partner unapologetically, like, oh yeah, give it to me. Yeah, that um excuse me, what the heck are you doing? Can't you see that we're busy? Can you get, just go on? get you know like it's almost as if like they witness velma doing that to their partner and like and like having that attitude when they saw that like in that regards if the mindy kaling velma did that to your partner then at that point i completely understand the anger i understand the grudge that you may have but that's not necessarily the case though is it it's just the fact that it's a bad animated show like, that's really the biggest crime that it actually went and committed. And there could be a variety of reasons as to why. But honestly, it's just seeing people going this extreme with their hatred. That is where I personally find to be very overwhelming. And that it can reach a level that I personally think that it can be quite toxic. And there is a part of it that when I do see that, honestly, I find that it can be a bit familiar as well. Because trust me, when it comes to getting angry over some animated project because you feel like it's so bad, I get it. I was there once. And from that time, I did receive backlash because I let that carry, carry it away. Like I made the mistake of not controlling my emotions during that time and it even got so intense that I ended up hurting people that I didn't necessarily mean to. And ever since then, I tried to go and retrace trace my steps and try to go and improve upon myself and like to learn from that whole experience. And honestly, that's where I'm honestly seeing that like that's what I've been seeing, like with all this rage against Velma and some other animated projects as well. It's on the fact that um, like the way people react to stuff like Velma, it's not that different than how I reacted towards stuff like Sony Pictures Animation and Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. And trust me, I know there's a lot of people who would be upset that I would do that kind of comparison to what they would go and regularly do.
And with those people, they would think like, oh, you know, they're doing it because like it's trending, it's popular to go and do so. But they don't realize the damage that they are doing or the kind of people that they are hurting while they're do you know, while they're expressing that kind of anger. And it's not just related to Velma. It's related in general to when the animation community is given a project that they just want to absolutely hate and destroy it for everything that it is worth. You know, they want to go and do that. And when they would go into that massive rage mode, they don't realize the people that they are hurting along the way. And that is especially the case with animators and especially the people who are working on Velma. Like as they are celebrate, you know, as they're celebrating the cancellation of Velma, they're like, they don't realize that they're also celebrating animators who are unfortunately losing their jobs. I mean, we know this very well, especially in this time, it's becoming harder and harder to maintain a job as an animator. In fact, nowadays, there are animators out there who have strong followings on social media that they have to go and announce that they have to go and sell their own personal stuff in order to go and make ends meet. And a big part of it is because of the current ecosystem of how Hollywood is right now, where you got shows like Velma that don't, that cannot survive beyond a second season. And that especially when big corporations that they want to try to go and save some money, they have to go and cut down thousands of jobs. And we've been seeing this again and again at studios like Warner Brothers, Disney, Paramount, and, and all that kind of stuff. Up, you know, it's been at the point where like it's becoming so excessive and it's becoming increasingly difficult. And I could go and state this right now that trying to go and celebrate the cancellation of a show like honestly, that really does not help at all. And it's something that I personally feel like are there some people in the animation community that actually do care about animators or do they just not at all? Because there will, because I can guarantee you, there are a lot of those people in that particular fandom that they're just blindly following along with what is considered trendy. Like it is insane to go and find that there are a lot of people amongst the animation fan base that they're gonna go and say that, uh, like hashtag I stand with you know stand with animation. They want to support animators. But then on the next post, they would go and celebrate the cancellation of Velma and throw all their hatred on certain animated projects that they absolutely despise. In fact, we have recently seen this occur. There were some animation fans that when Pixar announced that they would go and cut down like I think 70 jobs during that time, uh, that one of the people that was let go was Angus McLean who was the director of Lightyear. And considering some animation fans, uh, like they hated Lightyear with a passion, they actually celebrated that he ended up losing his job, that he ended up uh, get, he ended up getting fired and let go from Pixar, all in the basis of how much they hated Lightyear. And the point that I want to try to go and make is that there really is kind of that fine line when it comes to certain animation fans, again, not all of them, of course, but some of them can go way too far when it comes to their anger uh, for certain animation projects or when it comes to animated projects that they themselves really don't like. And maybe it's fueled by their own personal opinion. Maybe it's fueled by um, their lack of ability to try to control their emotions. Or maybe it's just because like they just want to go and follow the trend because you know it's you know they see their favorite influencers do it or they see how many likes it would go and get on social media so they want to try to go and do the same so they want to go and like take it to those kinds of extremes for their you know for that self righteousness for that you know to be a part you know to be a part of the cool kids club because like it, you know they think that they will belong if they would go and do these certain types of actions but again they don't realize the reality of the damage that they are doing 
when do you know when inflicting that kind of hatred and again this is not exclusive to velma this is in regards to if you would give the animation community uh, an anime a, a cartoon that they want to go and absolutely despise and this goes like with many others as well like this also includes like some of the recent ones like lightyear or uh wish for example or even some like from the past like with uh Teen Titans Go, or with SpongeBob, or with um, uh, the Emoji Movie. Like there, there have been several examples. You know, like you'll see many people that they will throw their hatred, they will go crazy on social media to express their anger, but they don't realize how hurtful their words actually are, and they don't realize the reality of who they are hurting. Rather, it be people that they highly admire, like some animators or some prominent filmmakers or even amongst their own personal group, like who they, they don't realize that like that they're hurting their friends along the way. I mean, it is easy to go and antagonize someone like me for what I've done with stuff like with uh, what I used to do with Sony Pictures Animation or Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. But those people who still antagonize me for that to this day, I could bet you they are too scared to look at the mirror and admit that they are doing the same thing with stuff like Velma and Wish. And honestly, I feel like that is kind of a dark reality that highlights a toxicity that's happening with the animation community. And I mean, I know that technically it's not just exclusive to them. Like we do see this all the time with several different fandoms as well. But still, that doesn't, uh, you know, that doesn't put out the fact that this is a massive problem that is happening within the animation community that there are some people in there that cannot control their emotions and that they let their anger get the best of them. They let their hatred towards certain cartoons uh, go a little too far and not realize the reality that they are doing more harm by expressing that kind of anger or at that level of that anger than they may actually realize. Again, I'm not taking away your opinion on Velma itself. I get it. It's not a good show at all. It sucks. It's cringe. It's way too cynical for its own good. I get it that it is not good. But the fact of the matter is, its biggest crime that it committed is just that it is not a good show. And that is it. And by that point, there is kind of a level of anger that you would need to go and express and like a bit of a limitation of how much you can go and express. Because if you're just going to go all out on it, then you're just going to be destructive and you're going to end up hurting yourself more so than the project that you want to go and hurt. And I can guarantee you, there's a lot of people out there who express their rage and anger towards Velma. They are hurting themselves more so than they are hurting the series. And trust me when I say that there are animators out there, there, there are a bunch of animators out there, some that you may admire as well, are not too happy to see your post celebrating the cancellation of Velma. I'm just saying. So if anything, I feel like this is a bit of an eye-opener on how toxic the animation fan base can be, especially when there is something that they don't like as well. It's just the problem of not controlling their emotions, the, of having that mistake of not putting in a, a bit of a limitation on like how emotionally engaged they would want to go into. And I am hoping that things can get better, that people can reflect upon that as well. Because again, I am just saying like, yeah, people will go and like to this day, still make fun of me, still m present me like a loser and a clown for the way that I treated Sony Pictures Animation and Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. But I am just saying, take a look at the mirror and take a look at the, th at the projects that you may not like. Regardless of how popular it may be to hate things on like Velma, are you really that different than how I was back then? I'm just saying, like take a good look at yourself. Regardless of how, how popular you get, or how many likes that you would receive on social media, it's a lot more similar than you may want to admit. So I just want to go and uh, put out my comments on all that. And, 
yeah, all right, fine. Velma is canceled, whatever. Like, at least the end, you know, at least like people can move on from that whole thing. And I do wish the best of luck to all the people who did work on the show that, again, they could go and quickly pick themselves back on their feet and that they'll find a new project that they'll have the opportunity to go and work on and still continue to go and make a living in terms of what they love to create. All right, so with that said, now I would like to go onto the chat wall, and I'd like to ask you all, what do you all think about the cancellation of Velma? Uh, if you have seen the show, I would love to know your thoughts on it, and also, how do you feel about the amount of hatred uh, that was given uh, that Velma received throughout its time on Max? Let me know what you think on all this. All right, let's see uh, what we got here. Even for me, I would also throw in the Proud Family louder and prouder. The hate behind that Proud Family revival is honestly ridiculous. And this is coming from someone who actually thinks the revival is slightly better than the original, especially with its updated animation. Yeah, exactly. It's like what I said. It is in general, uh, in terms of animated projects, it doesn't exclusively have to be like some of the prominent targets nowadays that the uh, that animation fans love to hate, whether it be Velma or Wish or anything like that. Like it's in regards to anything that they that in their opinion they think it's bad. Regard like and even if it's like a popular opinion or an unpopular opinion that they you know they could take they can like let their emotions like get the best of them and unfortunately go and take things too far. So yeah, like there 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 are some prominent examples that you could find. Uh let's see what else we have here. Um well, Velma on HBO Max I say good riddance. Some fans of Scooby Doo have been so toxic and so insane uh to go and attack the series and the creators to make the series the worst thing ever. I'm not sure for the Scooby Doo live action series on Max, but now finally we could give it a rest. If you want to see something crazier, check uh, check out the fall, the downfall of Diddy. It's about Sean Combs getting the hashtag Me Too for sexual misconduct for decades, uh, who's then what Harvey Weinstein did. It's just very horrible. Oh, absolutely, my God! Like, like, trust me, the downfall of P Diddy is like probably one of the biggest highlights of this year especially the stuff that's been revealed about the guy like honestly it's just layers upon layers of craziness especially like with over a thousand bottles of baby oil and almost 800 dildos found in his mansion like it's honestly insane what he has done but it's it, like honestly like as hilariously crazy as it can be like it's still massively tragic with how many victims uh uh, how, you know, that uh, P. Diddy has, and especially with his behavior towards women, it's like, it is unacceptable, and it should be considered downright criminal, and hopefully that's how he should be treated for the rest of his life, just a very dangerous criminal who had way too much power than he should. Uh, but anyways, um, I'll be straight for you. I got to watch the series, except for the second due to a uh, sublimit, and uh, I thought it was okay to bad. The mystery aspect was interesting, but trying to be Harley Quinn ruined it. Uh, but even for being canned, there was no celebrating. Even uh, a Disney show, Haley's on it, had that fate, and fans are moaning about it. Uh, it just proves right there, folks. Uh, proves right there, folks, are very hypocritical. Open your eyes. My condolences to the animators and do something better. <laughs> yeah, no wonder. No, I, I, I do understand where you're coming from. That is true. Uh, the damage that cancellation on projects of any kind and how jobs are affected is frightening and must be addressed to the fullest on hand. On the other hand, however, if it's this sort of show that would have potentially go as low as saying Ezra Miller did nothing wrong, the vitriol specifically towards that show is justified as long as uh, innocent creatives aren't bullied in the process. Yeah, exactly. And there are some fine lines. Like, with Velma, honestly, I cannot really think of, like, what it did that is so un that is so unethical you know it's not like the uh the the flash movie where it would go and try to enable someone who is quite literally a criminal with legit video evidence of their crimes so and not to mention that with the flash technically 
people already did get paid. They did their jobs and stuff like that. They're able to go and add their work onto their resume and stuff like that. So I get throwing that kind of hate towards something like The Flash because there are some things that it definitely did deserve. But when it comes to Velma, honestly, I don't think so. That's where the hatred went like way too far that fan that honestly animation fans are too scared to admit. Uh, let's see. I'm not real. I'm honestly not really that surprised. As much as I agree that Velma was bad and by far the worst thing to come out of Scooby Doo, I agree that the hate got massively overblown and out of control. And honestly, at this point, the show isn't even worth hating anymore, especially if it comes out at the cost of people's jobs and quite possibly the worst time with how much of a mess the animation industry is right now. Oh, yeah, trust me. How many animation fans are there? that forgot that right now the animation guild is still in talks with the uh with with with, uh, with hollywood producers right now or with hollywood executives in order to go and get a better deal in that regards i think that like i think animation fans might have forgot things the things like that are still happening when velma was announced to be canceled and stuff like that like, you gotta keep in mind, folks, like, have your priorities. Like, know where your battles are. Are you an actual ally? Do you, like, do you side with Hollywood executives with their decision to go and immediately cancel Velma? Or do you want to side with animators so that they could keep having their jobs? I'm just saying. Like, there is kind of, like, that moral line that you have to go and, like, consider. Uh, let's see. Look, I get why Velma isn't liked, and it sucks that this is one of those shows that could have been really good. But don't try to bother anyone that worked on this show, okay? Okay. Um, overall, I just hope we can all move on from this, and I find something we can enjoy together, but knowing the animation fan community online, they won't. Hopefully, we do. We could get a better Scooby-Doo adult cartoon series that is done right someday, something like The X-Files, but with Scooby-Doo characters. I mean, it is possible. I think there is an easy way that you can make an adult Scooby-Doo series that can actually be good. There's a lot of potential there. It's just that Velma tried and it didn't really work out. And I mean, it shouldn't be punished for it as if Velma was produced by P. Diddy, you know? It's not, like, trust me, Mindy Kaling Velma should not receive the same kind of reactions as P. Diddy. That, that, that should be a good rule right there. Uh, I think I only have time for one more comment. So um, let's see what we have right over there. Um, let's see. Would this be a good one? Or Okay. Uh, th oh, this should be interesting, actually. Um, speaking of going out of control with rage and hate, I'm not innocent myself. I have a horrible berserk uh, towards those who say negative things about 3D CG uh, in this chat included. And now having the reputation of lashing out when they say negative things about it and now being blocked for a week, I accepted that it was a waste of time. Now, what's next? I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be a Diego 2.0 and say don't un underestimate 3D. You know you shouldn't underestimate 3D. Now I'll focus on ignoring the opinions and focus on myself. Dude, you are in the step of a great direction right there. Like, the first thing you got to do is acknowledge your mistakes. Again, you can have whatever opinion you want. You know, you can be defensive. Or like, you can have a positive, a positive opinion towards computer animation or CG. You can have a positive opinion. Uh, or you can have, like, whatever negative opinion you have towards Velma. You could say that it sucks and it's one of the worst animated shows in recent years. That's perfectly fine. You just have to go and acknowledge the actions that you are doing that it can be a lot worse than it is. You know, like, that's going to, like, do you some harm. That's when you have to realize, like, can, like are you able to go and control your emotions during these kinds of arguments? And trust me, it could be a difficult path. And it took me quite some time to go and improve, you know, to improve myself on it. But... That like, honestly, you're like, as long as you do acknowledge it and you're working on yourself to become better so that you don't repeat that same kind of mistake, you're going to, you know, you're going to be, you're going to turn out to be fine. So honestly, hopefully we will take this as uh, a lesson about this entire thing and that hopefully there can be some acknowledgments uh, of people's actions or like when they rage a little bit too much uh, towards certain animated projects just because they don't like it. And that 
hopefully we will take more action in terms of calling them calling those people out so that they can go and acknowledge their mistakes and that hopefully they can go and improve all right so we're gonna go on to one more break and when we do return we will go and have what is partially a chat of a newly announced sequel that's going to be coming soon but also the celebration of the 30th anime uh, the 30th anniversary of one of the most prominent animation studios today so stay tuned for that and now everyone it is time that we shall go and cap off this episode with the great finale and for this grand finale we shall be discussing about dreamworks animation because during the weekend dreamworks celebrated their 30th anniversary yes it was 30 years ago in which three hollywood giants steven spielberg jeffrey katzenberg and david geffen all decided to cut to to work together in order to go and create a brand new major Hollywood studio, DreamWorks SKG. Now, the big studio itself, unfortunately, did not last long, and, and eventually DreamWorks pretty much fizzled out. But when it comes to the animation division, that went on to have a life of its own and to continue thriving and go through quite a fascinating history in itself. In fact, nowadays, the DreamWorks name belongs to that animation studio, where nowadays, if you say the word DreamWorks, the first thing that will come out of your mind is most likely going to be the animated movie, uh, the animated movies that came out of it. Rather, it be Shrek, Madagascar, Kung Fu Panda, How to Train Your Dragon, Trolls, The Boss Baby, and several others. And right now, they have celebrated their 30th anniversary to go and highlight their massive legacy that they have contributed to animation and honestly has now become one of the most prominent non-Disney animation studios out there. And yes, when it comes to the quality of their pictures, they can very much vary. Uh, like Honestly, there are some that can either be amazing or just be flat out garbage. In fact, what's interesting to note is that when it comes to uh, DreamWorks Animation, this year alone really does reflect very well on the type of quality that you get from DreamWorks Animation that can very much, like, you know, th there could be, like, a lot of different levels of how they could be. There are some that could turn out to be absolute garbage, like Megamind versus the Doom Syndicate. There are some that can actually turn out to be, well, as the kids say these days, pretty mid, like Kung Fu Panda 4. And then there are some that could turn out to be amazing to the point of becoming masterpieces, like with The Wild Robot. And speaking of the latter, by the way, at the same time as DreamWorks was celebrating their 30th anniversary, they also made a big announcement related to the Wild Robot that this is not going to be the last time that we will be seeing Roz and all the other animals on the island. Yes, Chris Sanders um, was at Deadline Contenders, and he was talking to some people, especially in relation to the, to the new movie that he directed, The Wild Robot. And he has confirmed, to read you here from my source, on Deadline, 100% yes, there are absolutely plans for a second one. Now, of course, this is still very early in production, and we do not have a confirmation about any other information. All we know is just the fact that DreamWorks, somewhere in the future, they want to go and create a sequel to The Wild Robot. So we don't have a confirmation of anyone in the cast that's going to be coming back, even though it's like pretty likely that we're going to see people like Lupita Nyong'o and uh, Pedro Pascal that are going to be returning to the feature. Um, we also did uh, like we 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 also don't know when specifically it's going to be coming out. We don't have a release date as of yet. We don't have um, uh, 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 information in terms of what the plot is going to be. We don't have anything like that so far. All we know is that with the Wild Robot, 
there's going to be a sequel. Oh, and by the way, on the uh, on a side note, there is also another announcement that recently happened with the Wild Robot that I do feel like is worth mentioning, and that is in terms of its home media release. Because Universal has announced that the Wild Robot will be coming out physically in 4K and in Blu-ray uh, on December 3rd. So it'll be right on time for the holiday season so that Maybe during whatever you may celebrate, whether it be uh, Christmas or Hanukkah or anything like that, that you could write down the Wild Robot as one of your gifts. But at the same time, they've also revealed when it will be released digitally, and that is going to be tomorrow. Yes, specifically on October 15th, that is when the Wild Robot can be released at home so that you could check it out on your computer, on your TV, or anything like that. But with that said, I just want to go and make a quick comment that um, regardless of where it does come out, I do highly recommend that as much as you can, if you do consider to go and watch The Wild Robot, go and see it on the big screen. Honestly, I feel like that is the best experience that you can go and get from it. Like if you want, like if you really want to immerse yourself in this feature, go and check it out in theaters as much as you can go and can. Uh, some people are, are asking, uh, what about streaming? There is no confirmation. Uh, there is no confirmation onto when it's going to be coming out on streaming yet. Uh, so far, when I say digital, I mean that. Like, if you go into, like, either Amazon, YouTube, or Apple TV Plus or whatever, that you would have to go and buy it so that you, or rent it so that you could go and uh, watch it at home. I don't think there's a confirmation on when it's going to be coming out on uh, either uh, Peacock or on, um, uh, on Netflix. So I think you'll still have to wait, but chances are it'll probably be sometime at the end of this year. Uh, but again, I do recommend I do recommend that as much as you can right now, go and check it out in theaters, if, like even if those options are out there right now. All right. So when it comes to the wild robot, I got to say, like things have been more surprising and things have been really getting better on top of the announcement of the of the home releases. And of course, also the announcement of the sequel. Uh, there's not to mention the fact that. It is still doing very strong at the box office where the decrease is only a bit slightly down. And on top of that, I didn't think anybody would go and like actually see this happen, especially soon. But the fact that the wild robot right now, if you look at how it did at the box office weekend, it's doing better than Joker Folie à Deux. It is like that movie has been doing so badly. The the like the the word of mouth has been so awful about that feature. Like it really notched down to third place. And I think like like compared to how it did in its um, first weekend, like it went down by like over eighty percent. Like it was so bad. Even Ro even Roz from the Wild Robot is looking back, going like. What the fridge happened? <laughs> you know, it's like that bad. But uh, anyways, um, to go and discuss about the sequel, I just want to go and state this right now that I will be getting into some spoilers. So if you guys have not seen The Wild Robot yet and you don't want to be spoiled, then I'm just going to say thank you all so much for watching, but I recommend you probably leave right now so that you don't get into these spoilers and that I don't ruin the movie for you. But if you have seen it and still want to go and uh, check out what I have to say, then at that point, let's go and continue. So with that said, uh, with the Wild Robot, of, co of course you guys know that, honestly, I love this movie. I definitely do agree that it is one of the best animated features that we got this year. I don't know if I would go as far and say that it's the best DreamWorks film that we've ever had, because keep in mind... When DreamWorks is great, they can make some amazingly phenomenal films. Like, would it be on par to stuff like Shrek 2, The Prince of Egypt, El Dorado, and some of those films? I feel like that would be massively debatable. But still, though, for what it did, it's definitely one of the best DreamWorks films in recent years, alongside Puss in Boots' The Last Wish. Uh, but when it comes to having a sequel, I'm not going to lie there's a part of me that is a bit conflicted. It's like, uh, you know, it, it, like, number one, it, like, it's very soon that 
we just got this announcement, you know, like it's, you know, it feels like the announcement just happened so fast. And technically the wild robot is still fresh in theaters. It's only been like what half a month that is on the big screen right now. And already they're just announcing a sequel. I, I feel like that might be, you know, that that might be going a little bit too quick. Uh, but on top of that, um, there is a part of me that is conflicted mainly because I feel like with the wild robot, I kind of question if it needs a sequel. It's a very solid feature on its own that I don't see how you could go and try to like really continue it because every, like, especially at the end, everything feels like it all, like it's all wrapped up so nicely, you know, like the animals managed to save themselves from like the, the big corporation that Roz is from. They were, you know, they managed to go and beat them. Roz went back to where, you know, where she belonged to be like as a service robot, but still has the memories of like when she would go and work uh, or when she was a wild robot. And especially that very tender moment at the end. Like, like honestly, it's like that one last moment where you have to cry before walking out. Um, when you see that beautiful moment when, um, Bright Bill and Roz got united and they still remember each other and still love each other. That's great. You know, it's, it's such a beautiful moment. And like, when I think about that, you know, I kind of think to myself, it's like, do we need a continuation? Do we need to hear more about that kind of story? Like, honestly, eh, I, I, honestly, it's like, I don't know. You know, like, I feel like it's kind of debatable and this is going to be a very hot take, but I kind of feel like maybe a sequel to The Wild Robot might be unnecessary. It works so well on its own that I cannot, you know, it's like hard to imagine. Can you really continue that? Can you really go and like, you know, make, you know, recreate that magic that you have just made? I don't know. Like, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of iffy. Like, yeah, I really do appreciate what we got with the first film, but does it need to be turned into a franchise? Eh, I don't know. I, just, I feel like that could be, yeah, I feel like it's debatable. But then again, even though I did say that, I know there are some arguments uh, to go and counter that and that maybe uh, having a sequel could be a good idea. Because number one, Let's take a look at the original books uh, that the movie is based on, the ones made by Peter Brown. And yes, they're like the books are actually a trilogy. And the the move the the wild robot is based on the first book itself. And there is a chance that maybe the book will like the second film will be based on the second book, which is called The Wild Robot Escapes. And I only read like a very short synopsis of what that book is about, but apparently, um, as the title would suggest, it's about Roz trying to escape from, from like the environment where she says like, oh, okay, well, I kind of belong here at Universal Dynamics. She wants to escape that man-made area so that she, she could probably go back to, uh, the, the island with all her animal friends, like Fink, Bright Bill, Thorn, and all those guys right there. Maybe there is that possibility that, they'll, you know, maybe they'll make a story that could be based on that. And if there is already a story that is established, and if that book is as solid as the first one, then, okay, maybe you'll have some materials uh, that you can go and actually create that second picture and actually maybe in the long run to create a very solid trilogy with. So maybe you could go and actually go and do, you know, maybe you could go and do that. Maybe there is already that idea that you could go and create for a sequel that could be equally as heartfelt as the first. But then there is the one counter argument that like, honestly, like on one hand, yeah, I do think like maybe a wild robot sequel might be unnecessary, but then again, DreamWorks is legendary when it comes to making a second movie. Now, I've probably mentioned this before in this podcast, but when DreamWorks would go and make a second film, like after the first one would be successful and then they would make a second, usually they would not only turn out to be better than the first, but they would turn out to be some of the best movies that they have done. Like the best from their respective franchises and the best from the studio in general. Now, I know that this rule does not apply to all their number two movies. Like, I know some people could debate, like, the second, you know, like, 
I don't see that many people say that Madagascar Escape to Africa is the best Madagascar film, or I don't see that many people sharing a lot of that love for Crude's A New Age, you know what I mean? But when it comes to most of the others, they can be absolutely amazing. And I even consider some of the best DreamWorks films are a lot of the second films. Shrek 2, Kung Fu Panda 2, How to Train Your Dragon 2, Puss in Boots The Last Wish, even when it comes to their franchises that are not as good as many of the other films. Like, when it comes to their weaker franchises, I think the best movies from them are those second films. I personally enjoyed the, the second Boss Baby movie more so than the first, because honestly, I kind of appreciate about how absolutely unhinged it was. Um, also, when it comes to the Trolls movies, I think the best one is the second one. Trolls World Tour. Yeah, it's not a great movie, but I honestly love the world building that they have crafted. I feel like it is perfect for a Trolls movie that had a lot of wonderful potential, some of which I feel like that they have legitimately met. So when they would go and make a second film, oh yeah, they know how to go and exceed those expectations to make something that could debatably be better. And when it comes to The Wild Robot, I do think there could also be a chance that it could actually turn out to be great. Like, it's the kind of thing that, honestly, people should hold, you know, they should hold out, hold on their comment when it comes to saying that, oh, this is the best DreamWorks animation film. Don't say that just yet, because there is a likelihood that the second is going to come out, and then you would go and say that. Now, when, then it would be the time. So, as you could see... I'm very much conflicted on having a uh, Wild Robot sequel, but it can, I feel like it could go either way. But it's all based on like how much I really like that first film. On one hand, the movie was very solid, and I just don't really see like does it like I kind of question if we need a sequel in the first place, considering that the first one really wrapped things up so nicely. But then, on the other hand, DreamWorks is great when it comes to making second pictures, and I can imagine that The Wild Robot 2, or maybe they'll title it like the book and call it The Wild Robot Escapes, I can imagine that second film could also turn out to be absolutely amazing, even more so than in the first. But either way, we'll have to wait and see with how that goes. And as to when this will come out, honestly... I don't really know, but if I would have to go and guess, considering that it's, you know, it does take some time, and so far, Chris Sanders only announced that they are making a second film, I would take a guess that, more or less, it's going to be coming out in 2028. If they start production immediately, I'm expecting The Wild Robot 2 is going to be coming out maybe in 2028. Like, if they would go and speed, like, if production goes by, like, more smoothly than anyone would expect, like, it would, it, there would be a rare chance it could come out in 2027, but then again, there is also that likelihood that, much like with some of the movies, um, it would require some extra time, like, maybe with, uh, like, you know, similar to uh, the How to Train Your Dragon films, like, they would need, like, five years of production, and that maybe we won't see the wild robot until 2029 even but i would say like the safest bet could probably be 2028 but that's my guess we'll we'll have to wait and see in the future with how universal is going to schedule that thing all right so with that said let us now go on to the chat wall and i'd like to ask you all what do you all think about a sequel to the wild robot um do you think it deserves to have a sequel do you think it's amazing do you think that the sequel could turn out better than the first do you think we need a wild robot sequel let me know what you all think all right as a kid of the new millennium I'm, uh, I'm happy to grow up with many of DreamWorks Animation's works, even more than Disney and Pixar. Also, with how Roz is doing so far at the box office like beating out the Joker, I'm curious to how the next task will visually go, considering that The Wild Robot is the studio's final in-house production. But as long as this and the Bad Guys sequel uh, has their stylized CG aesthetic, I'm down. What? <coughs> Oh, excuse me. Lastly, to support Roz on the big screen, I'll catch it a third viewing.
<laughs> uh, very nice. Uh, I'm sure there might be a competition of how many times are you going to go and watch The Wild Robot? And on a side note, just want to quickly mention, don't forget to go and share some love to uh, Transformers 1 as well. Don't let that simmer out. Don't let that fizzle out to become a box office flop. That movie deserves some love as well. So just want to go and quickly mention. Anyways, um, first of all, happy anniversary DreamWorks Animation. To everyone at DreamWorks, thank you guys so much for being part of my childhood and glad to hear out that the Wild Robot is doing well. I honestly can't uh, can't wait for that Wild Robot sequel. Hopefully Chris Sanders will be back on it again. I'm just happy that the Wild Robot is doing better than Joker 2 in this case. I think I'll watch it again soon before my birthday. Alright. As someone who absolutely loved The Wild Robot, I, I'm definitely all for the idea of a second movie. Considering how there are more Wild Robot books, I could see how they can adapt them for a sequel. So overall, I'm looking forward to this. Also, right now, with how The Wild Robot has been doing better than Joker 2, with how it was an absolute disaster, it's honestly kind of a hilarious. Yeah, how ironic is it that the jo you know, that we got a new Joker movie, but it's a robot who end up getting the last laugh out of it. <sighs> All right, uh, let's see now. On one hand, I think it's a little soon to announce a sequel to a brand new film. But on the other hand, considering that the book series of the film is based on is a trilogy and DreamWorks having a good track record with making sequels, I'm definitely down to see how it'll play out. The only small concern I have is whether will the animation and the characters receive a downgrade, but honestly, I digress. I'm so happy that the Wild Robot is doing so well. Haha, ha, take that Joker. <laughs> All right, let's see now. You must know for a fact that DreamWorks Pictures still exists today as a production company. Does it? Honestly, I heard, I feel like it's been long gone. Like, uh, like it's been, it's been far too long since I've seen like, DreamWorks be prominent for a live action production. I don't know. Like may I may have gotten that wrong and I I do sorry, you know, and I am sorry if I if I did that little screw up, but still though, I I just feel like DreamWorks as a production for the live action films and stuff like that, it is not as prominent as how they used to be back in like the 90s and the 2000s. I'm just I, you know, I just want to go and state that right now. Uh anyways, um However, I am so happy that DreamWorks Animation is still around. One of my favorite movies from them is Shrek, which I still have on VHS. Happy anniversary to DreamWorks Animation. I thankfully saw The Wild Robot on my birthday in theaters, and I had a great time. I also want to thank you for changing your ways around your hatred against Sony Animation. May I ask when you, ch oh, when you changed your ways about it? Honestly... Well, it took a little bit of time, but I think there was the, like, I think, like, the true moment was when I had that chat with uh, Yoshi Player. And then, uh, like, from 2018 to 2019 onward, like, you know, I would train myself as to how I would approach Sony Pictures Animation, uh, especially, like, with the reviews of, um, like, Hotel Transylvania, uh, tra uh, the, the, no, that third movie, then there was uh, Spider-Verse, and then, of course, there was also the open season um, the reviews where, you know, that I would go and train myself to, to treat Sony Animation no differently than I would with the others. It took me some time, but like I think it's safe to say that nowadays I definitely have grown uh from that. Like especially like one thing that I am happy to look back onto is especially like like the biggest proofs that I've grown since then have been my review of Hotel Transylvania Transformania and the um recent uh history video on sausage party. So I think it's those were the indicators. But again, like it, you know it's something that you know, I had to work on myself to go and change that kind of habit and change my view on Sony animation. I mean, I still have my opinions on them. And yeah, they, they're, there's, I know there's still hot takes. Like the Cloudy with a Chance of Beatballs films are just absolute garbage. And so are the Hotel Transylvania films. But I am aware that, hey, it's just my opinion. And that's okay. Regardless of like what people may say about it. Uh, but anyways, uh, let's go back into the wall robot here. Um, I don't have a lot to say for the wild robot since I haven't seen it yet. Ooh, crap. You stay for the spoiler part? <laughs> Anyways, uh, uh, everyone, including you, have said amazing things about it. So obviously, I will say even I'll take some convincing to try to see it. However, I will say mostly a happy 30th anniversary to DreamWorks from blockbusters to fan favorites from Shrek to Penguins of Madagascar. 
Hope you all uh, hope you'll always come out strong to your on your future to all the animators and presenters of the studio. Keep it up. Very nice words, dudes. Very nice words. OK, I think I'll read one more comment and then that'll be it for this episode. Happy anniversary to DreamWorks Animation. Uh, I am happy to grow up with a bunch of DreamWorks animation and love films like Madagascar, Kung Fu Panda, and Shrek. With The Wild Robot, I think it's too soon to release it on digital, but I think that a sequel to The Wild Robot could potentially be as great as the first. Go watch both The Wild Robot and Transformers 1 in theaters instead of Joker 2. Well, at least I do know for a fact that... Uh, there is one of the things that people are definitely doing. I know people are not going to watch Joker 2, that's for sure. <laughs> and with that said and done, that should do it for today's episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast. Hey, thank you all so much for joining me on this. And since this is still Canadian Thanksgiving, I am definitely thankful for all of you for joining me to make this a great episode and i just want to go and say that if you guys want to go and follow more of my crazy escapades with this podcast then all you have to do is go to subscribe to my um twitch channel animat live and to the animat's crazy cartoon cast youtube channel and also if you want to go and support my work and get some amazing rewards including but not limited to seeing my videos before anyone else then all you have to do is go to patreon.com slash animat and at the same time, if you want to go and uh, listen, if you are listening to this podcast on whatever podcast service you're listening to, then don't forget to go and follow me there, rather it be on uh, Spotify, Apple, Amazon, and many more. And with that said and done, I would like to say thank you all so much for listening. Thank you all so much for watching. And until next time, see you later, dudes.